The following program is a production of the Barroom Network. It is intended for all audiences. Doug Buffoon. This defense sucks. This is moronic. John Buffoon. If your best run plays are coming off end arounds, there's a problem. Doug was behind the microphone first. He never held back. Very difficult to score when your offense is on the bench. When your defense is out there giving up 70, 80, 70, 64 yard drives. Now, it's his nephew, John. And there's no holding this buffoon back either. An offensive minded coach that's running an offense that got nine yards and a half. A beaten up defense that isn't necessarily performing in key situations. And a quarterback that was expected to take a big step forward looks like an unsalvageable wreck. I've had it! I have had it! I want somebody to get kicked in the ass! How many games can you rattle off that involve the team running the ball seven times and they win? I can't think of any. I don't mind you getting beat. I got my ass whipped many times. But I tell you, I took somebody down with me. Because Bears fans wanted to believe in the worst way that Chicago had a stable, competitive franchise. And this is what we got. It's Buffone 55, the John Buffone Show. Welcome to another edition of Buffoon 55, and after another less than perfect Chicago Bears win, we are back. I am your host, John Buffoon, and with me as always is my producer and co-host, Alyssa Barbieri. Alyssa, how you doing? How you feeling after the latest Bears win? Well, I'm still alive after those two last second <laughs> finishes that, you know, it's just incredible that, that they're 2-0, and oh, but... Hey, the Bears are undefeated. They are uh, a whisker away from being 0-2, but nevertheless, they are 2-0. and An undefeated squad can't complain uh, about that. But I am anxious to share more thoughts about the game, learn about the Bears' upcoming opponent from our guest, and delve into more Bears talk. But first, you have some business to take care of. Take it away. Thanks, John. So I like to remind people and tell our new listeners that an important part of our show is our B-55 segment. That's when I ask you five questions and your response must be completed within 55 seconds. The 55 is your tribute to the great Doug Buffon, your uncle who played 15 seasons with the Bears and wore number 55. I love the segment and I always love your interviews with our guests. So let's get to that now. Thanks, Alyssa. We are fortunate to have a return visit from our guest. Aaron Freeman is the webmaster over at FalcFans.com and the host of the Locked On Falcons and co-host of the Falcon Central Radio Podcast. That's why he's our go-to guy for Falcons facts and figures. Aaron, thanks for being on. How you doing, bud? Doing great. Happy to be here. We want to really kind of dissect this matchup. I think it's a very intriguing matchup between the Bears and the Falcons. 1-2-0, 1-0-2, but no, the Falcons not that far away from being undefeated as well. Uh, but they are winless after two weeks. They've lost to a talented Seahawks squad, then lost on a last-second field goal after putting up 39 points in a bizarre game against the Cowboys. Uh, right now, are the Falcons better than their 0-2 record suggests? Yes, but I don't know if they're that much better. I think they definitely should have won the Cowboys game. I think certainly the Seahawks game could have been closer. There was a point in the third quarter where they were had an opportunity to get back into that game and really uh, assert themselves, but they failed to take advantage. And I think Seattle's proven, you know, over these last couple of weeks that they are one of the better teams in, in the NFL. So it doesn't feel like that was too much of a blown opportunity, but certainly, as you alluded to last week's game, it seemed like that game was all wrapped up until the final five minutes, and then the Falcons made a series of catastrophic mistakes and and you know just brain farts, uh, particularly on on an onside kick that will, will go down in infamy just as bad as twenty eight to three uh, among Falcon fans and and probably the national media who love to to poke fun at the Falcons for these types of. Um, uh, issues. So yeah, I, I think they certainly should have won last week's game, but I, I do feel like this team is not quite performing at a level where, you know, they are looking, you know, looking at a situation where I, I feel like they have underachieved so far this season. Um, so their record kind of reflects that. 
You talked about the, the the brutal loss in the Super Bowl, and ever since then, it's been a little bit of an uphill climb. They're, they're reeling from that brutal collapse against the Cowboys last week. Uh, a lot of those mistakes sometimes can go back to coaching. So I want to ask you, how hot is Dan Quinn's seat right now? Is he coaching for his job again? Uh, is, is that kind of the feeling over there? Yeah, it's, it's scorching hot is the answer to, to that question. Um, it, there is a possibility that if the Bears come out and embarrass the Falcons uh, this weekend, that you know he, he could lose his job on Monday. That's a, that's possible. I, I don't think it's likely, wow. but it, it's certainly possible. That's a, that's how hot the seat is. Uh, what what has been the I guess the review uh, as far as the fan base goes or or, or amongst the media. Uh, should did, did they feel like Dan Quinn should have got another chance this year? They did finish so strong last year, but what has been the, I guess, overall review on his performance as the head coach? I think retaining Dan Quinn at the time when the Falcons announced it last December was not particularly popular among the fans. Um, I think everybody likes Dan Quinn. He's a likable guy, but I think people sort of look at the last couple of seasons since the Falcons' Super Bowl loss of just sort of diminishing returns and i think everybody was ready to move the team in another direction potentially wash that bad taste out of their mouth from that super bowl it always feels like that sort of hanging over the franchise and getting a, a fresh start with a new uh, coaching staff i think most people were looking forward to uh, after last season's disappointing one and seven start but of course they were able to turn around six and two and you you guys know how fans and media tend to be in the offseason everything's looking up everything's you know sparkly and rosy and so all of a sudden it, it seemed like people were buying back into the falcon team uh by the time we reached august and, and really excited about whether or not this team was going to get back into the playoff race and then immediately you know in week one uh given the buzz saw by the name of russell wilson um <laughs> it, it immediately the bottom fell out and and people were back to that same sort of pessimistic I'm over it sort of mindset. <laughs> Doesn't take long to completely shift moods, but uh, I want to start breaking this team down just a little bit. I want to start with quarterback Matt Ryan. Uh, a solid start despite the losses, but uh, how would you say Ryan is performing in these uh, first two games and in his 13th season? Uh, is he still playing as well as he has? I would say Ryan's playing reasonably well. I, I think, you know, because we still have the memory of his MVP season in our minds. We still have the memory of what was a really strong start in 2018 uh, in the second year of offensive coordinator Steve Sarkeesian, where he was putting up numbers comparable to his MVP season, which was a historic year. I, I, you know, the he hasn't been performing at that level. Uh, they, they wound up moving on from Sarkeesian uh, after 2018, hiring Dirk Cutter. And it, Last year, Ryan just didn't look right. It was one of his worst seasons of his career. Um, just from a statistical standpoint, he still wasn't a, an above average uh, starter compared by league-wide standards and, and a top 10 guy uh, based off of various metrics. But, but it was one of those things where the Matt Ryan that we've grown accustomed, the, the very good Matt Ryan, wasn't quite there. And I don't know if he's significantly better this year, he's he's flashed some things, but it just does seem like certain things are off. But it, it's one of those things where it just may take him a little bit of time just because of the limited offseason to really get back in the stride. So hopefully he can start to pick things up uh, this week against the Bears. One guy that Atlanta brought in to try to take the pressure off of Matt Ryan was running back Todd Gurley, who they brought in to replace Devontae Freeman. He's been relatively average over the first two weeks, amassing no more than 61 yards on the ground. What are the uh, early returns on Todd Gurley? He's been solid if you're looking for a functional uh, complementary runner uh, for a pass-heavy offense, which is what the Falcons really are with Matt Ryan with Julio Jones, with Calvin Ridley, that's where their bread is butter. They're, they're a team that no one looks at the Falcons and and is scared of their running game. It, it can be effective. It, it showed that at times over the first two games. But you're really scared of this passing attack. And I think Gurley has been good enough um, to sort of give you a little bit of a threat uh, and give you some balance uh, in the ground game. But you're not going into this game worried about 
oh no, we need to stack the box against Ty Gurley. He just he's just not that same player that he was a couple of years ago when he was arguably the best running back in the NFL and was a offensive player of the war, of the year award winner back in 2017. He's not the type of guy that can carry your offense, um, but he can give you some balance and, and complement your passing game. And he's he's done that uh, capably uh, this so far this season. I want to kind of shift and go to the tight end position real quick because Atlanta did part ways with Austin Hooper in free agency and brought in uh, former first rounder Hayden Hurst from Baltimore. We know Matt Ryan likes to rely on the tight end sometimes. How has Hayden Hurst looked? Is he going to be the long term solution there at tight end? Yeah, I mean, it, it would be interesting to sort of see how it develops long term. Hayden Hurst a little bit older, played some minor league baseball, so he, you know he's not necessarily the same age as your typical uh, third year tight end is. But uh, he he's looked solid so far he he made a couple of big plays against the cowboys um and in hoping that he can do the same against this uh, bears defense i know uh danny trevathan has been having some issues uh these past two weeks and hopefully we can get some favorable matchups uh with hurst on trevathan uh this weekend but yeah he's he's been solid for the falcons his blocking hasn't been great um and that was a big reason why he kind of lost favor in baltimore because as you guys know they're so run oriented and he was kind of the weakest bl- link when it came to the the blocking uh at, at the tight end position and that's why he kind of uh, got lost in the shuffle there and uh, he hasn't necessarily improved that so far here in atlanta but he's been a valuable asset in the passing game you're dead on about Trevathan, but we're going to get into that a little bit later. Uh, how is the uh, offensive line holding up uh, for the Falcons? Because obviously the Bears want to get after the quarterback, Robert Quinn, Khalil Mack. Um, they haven't, haven't been as consistent as the Bears would hope, but uh, what do you think the odds are against this Atlanta offensive line? Well, I've been pleasantly surprised by the Falcons' offensive line. That was a, a major area of weakness, the biggest area of weakness on their offense last year, arguably, uh, besides the running game. And um, they've played pretty well uh, so far this season. You know, Matt Ryan has not really seen much pressure uh, against Seattle. That wasn't as major an issue just because, you know, Seattle doesn't have the best pass rushers, uh, you know, and they were effective throwing some blitzes at the Falcons, but they had to sort of bring extra guys because their front four wasn't effective at getting pressure on the quarterback. One of the concerns I had going into the Week 2 game was Dallas with guys like Demarcus Lawrence and Alden Smith and Everson Griffin given the upgrade in, in the pass rushers that they had, uh, that they would be able to get after the quarterback. And I think the Falcons offensive line answered the bell uh, ably, and, and they even had an injury early in the game with right tackle Kayla McGarry and the swing tackle Matt Gano stepped in and, and played really well uh, going up against a guy like Demarcus Lawrence and arguably outperformed any performance we've seen from Kayla McGarry over the last year since he was the team's first round pick in 2019. So they're dealing with some injuries up front, but their offensive line has been able to weather the storm and answer every question. And I think again this week they'll get tested against this Bears front who has some very formidable pass rushers. Um, and so this to me is going to be another great litmus test to sort of see if the first two weeks were they flukes or is this offensive line legitimately, um, you know, can, could be considered one of the better offensive lines in the NFL. Let's let's switch sides of the ball. I want to talk about the Falcons defense a little bit because they stumbled out of the gate last year before turning things around. But uh, this unit this year has given up about, uh, I think, 78 total points in the first two games. So does this current Falcons defense resemble uh, the early defense of last year or the late defense of last year? <laughs> well, the scary thing is it's it's kind of a little bit of both. Stylistically, <laughs> they're, they're doing some of the same things that they did in, in the second half of the season when they were really able to turn their season around, largely due to the defense being able to get stops and, and play well. Um, but the execution it is more like that team that started off one and seven and had one of the worst defenses in the entire NFL. Clearly the numbers show you that. So it, it's one of those things where they're, they're trying to do many of the same things that they did in the second half of last year. And it's not working. I think some of that is owed to the fact that in the second half of last season, they kind of benefited from some not stellar quarterbacks. 
uh, guys like Kyle Adam for the Panthers, Jameis Winston, who generally plays very well against the Falcons, but as you guys know, is very prone to turnovers, turned the ball over 40 times last year. Kyle Allen, I think, turned the ball over 30 times. Those two guys combined for like 11 turnovers in the in the four games that they played against the Falcons in the second half of the season, and that was a contributing factor uh, to the Falcons' defensive turnaround. Gardner Minshew in his rookie season, Jimmy Garoppolo uh, were some of the other quarterbacks that they faced. So it was really only Drew Brees for two games uh, that you, you saw a high-level quarterback against this Falcons defense, and the pass rush was able to sort of limit him in one of those games, which is why the Falcons were able to surprisingly beat the Saints in the second half of the season. And the issue that they're dealing with this year is they're not getting the benefit of questionable quarterback play, at least through the first two games with Russell Wilson, who's so far this season, you know, definitely thrown his hat uh, and potentially a front runner for the MVP race. If you're just judging it off the first two games so far this year and Dak Prescott, who's, you know, been an emerging player and ascending player and is looking to, uh, you know, be one of the highest paid quarterbacks in the NFL. And certainly, uh, made uh, Jerry Jones's wallet a little nervous, I guess, based off of his performance in that week two game and certainly showing that he's definitely, at least in that game, uh, worthy of, of being one of the higher paid quarterbacks in the league. So the Falcons haven't benefited from some shoddy quarterback play um, these first two games. I will let you guys tell me if you think they will be able to get uh, some uh, – that that to flip uh, this upcoming week with Mitch Trubisky coming to town, but uh, you know I, I think it's 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 been a situation where I think the Falcons' defense has stylistically and philosophically mirrored what they did in the second half of the season, but they just haven't been able to execute. And I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that they're not facing uh, you know Kyle Allen's not walking through that door as they say. <laughs> Look, Mitch is playing better, but I don't think he's uh, Russell Wilson or Dak Prescott quite yet. But <laughs> going going into this matchup. The Bears are trying to find their identity on offense. They started running the ball a little bit more last week. So that that kind of brings up my next question of if the Bears are going to be really successful against this Atlanta defense, should they stick to the run game? Or do, are there going to be some real opportunities for Mitch Trubisky to roll out of the pocket and throw? Or uh, I guess it, it could be both. But if, if the Bears are really going to cut uh, cut a uh, make a big cut in this Atlanta defense, is it going to be through the run game or through the air? I think the the Falcons' pass defense has been the thing that has been exposed over and over again uh, these first two games. Uh, their run defense has been okay, I guess. It, you know, teams haven't had to really run the ball effectively to be able to move the ball, so it's kind of been untested. So I, I, I you know, I don't have a, a definitive answer for you. Because I look at this game as a situation where if it was me, and again, I, I don't watch the Bears every single day, but I did watch the first two games, um, I would not want to put the ball in the Mitch Trubisky's hands. I just think that's not putting him in an advantageous situation to have to make him go out there and win the game through the air. So I think I would probably stick to the run game and see what I can do early in the game and, and try to be a little bit more balanced um, you know, moving forward and and lean on the running game. So I would say that, but you know, I think when you look at some of the issues the Falcons have had on in in the secondary, particularly, it wouldn't surprise me if Matt Nagy's a little tempted to dial up a little bit more passes uh, to see if he can find ways to exploit that unit as the Cowboys and Seahawks have already this season. Yeah, because they lost Desmond Trufant in free agency and then draft. Uh, Clemson's AJ Terrell in the first round. Uh, how has that transition been to, to having a, having a rookie in there? Uh, is that is that going to be an opportunity that uh, Trubisky can maybe pick on him, or is he has he flashed so far this year? He's flashed so far this year. I, I think he's shown promise. I, I think you know his flashes are in the midst of <laughs> of you know just an absolute disaster when the Falcons defense is so far this season. So it, it, it's hard to tell. Uh, how effective he is, but he's he's certainly shown some things that I think are very promising for his future and, and the fact that I think he has emerged as the team's most reliable uh, cornerback. Their main issues have been the other corner, Isaiah Oliver, who's shown improvement after a disastrous 2019 season and was a major contributing factor to the struggles that the team had in the first half of the season, giving up big play after big play uh, over those first seven, eight games. He's improved, but he's still vulnerable to giving up some of those big plays. He gave a big touchdown catch to DK Metcalf uh, in week one. He gave up uh, the sort of big catch to Michael Gallup late in the game that sort of set up uh, the 
almost I think the final touchdown uh, for the Cowboys that then they were able to recover the onside uh, and and get the game winning field goal. Um, so it, it's one of those things where Oliver's main issue has been always been he struggles against speed and he I think he, he's played better, but. When he gets into matchups like he had a week ago with guys like Michael Gallup and CeeDee Lamb and, and two weeks ago with DK Metcalf, with guys he just can't stay in phase with from a speed standpoint, he tends to get exposed. I don't know. You know, I, I know the Bears have a young uh, speedster in, in Darnell Mooney and and no one would call Anthony Miller or, or Allen Robinson slow in that regard. So I think they'll have some opportunities to exploit him uh, in that regard. But the Falcons corners. Obviously, the numbers tell you that they have not played particularly well, but I think relative to some of the other issues on the defensive side of the ball, given that they are young and inexperienced and and the bar was kind of low entering the season, given that they were the biggest question mark on the defense, uh, I feel like they've played better than at least my low expectations were. So I don't feel as down on them as maybe outside people would be, but certainly they have not played great this season. Ah, pretty good news for Bears fans for the most part. Uh, we usually like to give a well-rounded look at the Bears' next opponent, so bear with us here, uh, all puns intended. Uh, can, can you talk about the special teams of Atlanta a little bit? Is there anybody that flashes there or anybody that the Bears should be worried about or anybody the Bears can take advantage of, whether it's a kicker, a returner, a gunner, a long snapper, anything uh, from Atlanta's special teams unit that uh, should be on the radar? Well, I mean, if you kick an onside kick against the Falcons, you know, <laughs> might you might be able to benefit of that. No, I I think their special teams has been pretty solid outside of that one <laughs> play. One really to, bad play. Yes, the the easiest play it would seem that they would have should have been able to make uh, was the one play that they they really messed up. You know, their kicker Young Way Koo uh, is been one of the best onside kickers in the league. So I I, I guess like the mojo that he has for being able to create onside kicks, I, I guess the Falcons is just not enough mojo to fit all in the same universe because they just couldn't feel those. But I think for the most part, their special teams has been solid. The return game hasn't really done a whole lot, but I think that's, you know, in part due to the fact that, you know, touchbacks have made kickoffs not a factor that much in the game like they, they used to be. And uh, punters are so good now that it's kind of getting that way with punts to where it's a lot of fair catches, a lot of directional kicking, and the punters are so good now that if they want to keep the ball away from guys that they can. So their return game isn't great. Their coverage unit has been solid, but it hasn't been tested as many units haven't been so far this season. So, um, you know, I know Cordero Patterson's one of the best returners in, in the league so if he gets an opportunity to return one it, it wouldn't surprise me if, if he can get a, a big gain or two but i imagine the falcons will do their best to sort of kick it away from him so that he doesn't get that opportunity so i think their special teams has been solid but uh given certain variables it hasn't been truly truly tested yet uh, before I turn you over to uh, Alyssa, I know she might have some questions. I want to talk to you real quick about uh, the injury report. Those came out today. A good amount of Falcons on the injury report. Uh, anyone that should be on the radar? I saw that uh, Julio Jones was a little uh, a little banged up. Any any chance that any of their big players do not suit up this weekend? I think Julio Jones is the big one. Um, obviously, not having him on the field completely changes how the Falcons approach teams and how defenses approach them just because so regularly speaking, he gets that bracket coverage in those double teams. Uh, and in past years when Julio has been a little bit banged up, they've been willing to play him even as a decoy for large chunks of games. Um, and it, I imagine based off of what we've heard so far this week, but again, we'll find out later in the week. Uh, if he does play, it might be as a little bit of a decoy. You know, he it won't be to the point that he won't get the ball, but, uh, you know, they'll they'll pick and choose his spots um, if, if that is the situation. And so if Julio Jones is more of a decoy or out of the lineup completely, the Falcons are going to have to find a way to run their offense through Calvin Ridley. Uh, he's played exceptionally well so far this season. Uh, he was really lighting up the Cowboys secondary and, and was virtually uncoverable uh, throughout that game. But he's never had to deal with the fact of being the number one guy, getting all the attention. He's always had the benefit of being singled up uh, opposite Julio Jones because Julio's draw, drawing all the double teams. So he might get a little taste of that this week. And I think it's a question mark whether or not uh, he's 
at least at this point in time in his career poised to be able to handle that. So I think of all the injuries, Julio is the one that stands out, but the Falcons are pretty beat up. They need to get uh, their pass rusher, Tack McKinley. He's been their most effective pass rusher outside of Grady Jarrett so far this season. And if uh, he's not healthy, their big free agent pickup, Dante Fowler has been dealing with an ankle injury. He has not been particularly effective through these first two games. And it doesn't seem like he's things are going to change this week as he continues to battle that ankle issue. So it's one of those things where he's probably the second most uh, critical uh, component to get back to McKinley. That is the injury bug continues to bite a lot of teams in the NFL. And if those, some of those players you talked about don't play on Sunday, that's, Excellent news for the Bears kind of changes the entire dynamic of things. But uh, Alyssa, I'm going to bring you in. You got anything that you want to ask, Aaron? Yes, I do. I got a couple. Uh, So, Aaron, what would you say is uh, your biggest concern heading into this game? Uh, The Falcons defense would be my biggest concern. Can they actually uh, stop? They, They couldn't stop Russell Wilson. They couldn't stop Dak Prescott. Can they actually stop Mitch Trubisky? Uh, probably a much better uh, opportunity to do that against Trubisky. Uh, so is there like a matchup that you're going to be watching closely, whether, you know, it's the defense against the Bears offense or what matchup will you be watching? As I said, I think, you know, the Calvin Ridley, he's regardless of Julio Jones's health, I think the Falcons are going to have to run their offense through him. So I think the matchup between him and Kyle Fuller and, and Jalen Johnson, I think it's going to be interesting to sort of see how he handles that one. And before we let you go, I, I have to get your prediction uh, for the game. So how do you see this one uh, playing out? I've predicted the Falcons to win each of the last two weeks and been very wrong in those predictions. So I am doing going for the reverse jinx and Don't. picking the Bears. No! No! <laughs> no you got- <laughs> that never does well on this show. <laughs> so um, I, I feel like it's going to be a close one. Um, but I, I, it's hard for me, even without the sort of reverse jinx mindset in it, it's hard for me to sort of see the Falcons defense being able to keep this Bears uh, offense scoring low enough because I, I think the Falcons offense is going to struggle to move the ball against this Bears defense. I think I, I respect that Bears defense a lot. I think they have a lot of playmakers at all three levels. And I don't see this Falcons offense putting up enough points to out um, score this um, Bears offense going up against this weekend Falcons even. So all that to say is I'm feeling like it's going to be like a 23-20 sort of Bears win. Oh, thanks for the kiss of death there, Aaron. But uh, before before we before we get you out of there, uh, get you out of here, can you please tell our listeners where they can find your work and interact with you on social media? Yeah, they can find me every day on Locked on Falcons podcast, daily podcast. You can find on uh, all podcast platforms out there. And we talk Falcons every day on that podcast. A lot of questioning Dan Quinn's job security in recent days. Uh, so that will be a topic of discussion and certainly will be an even bigger topic of discussion if they don't take care of business this weekend against the Bears. But uh, you can also find me on Twitter at Falcfans. That's F-A-L-C-F-A-N-S. Excellent. Aaron Freeman, host of the Locked on Falcons podcast. Aaron, thanks so much for being on. We'll talk to you down the road. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys having me on. Absolutely. We got a lot more show coming up. We'll be right back. Hey, everyone. Ryan Badgley from the Barfly Tailgate Show. And football season is kicking off. And I know you feel like I do, so to steal a phrase from WWE superstar Daniel Bryan, yes, yes, yes. And I also know you are like me and you love the work Allen Robinson is putting out on the football field, but also off the field. That's why we're so pleased to partner with the Allen Robinson Within Reach Foundation. Their work provides educational opportunities and resources to low-income and inner-city Chicago students to help put success within reach. How can you help? Immediately, you can visit allenrobinson12.org and learn more about what they are doing and make a donation. If you can't donate money, can you donate your time? The foundation is always looking for volunteers. And please let others know about their great work. In the coming weeks, the Barroom Network will hold some fundraising efforts, and we hope that you'll be a part of those. And again, let your family and friends know. Now, how about them Chicago Bears? I'm so psyched up for this season. I think A-Rob has 100 catches and double-digit touchdowns. 
Now let's bear down. Welcome back. Now it is time for our B55 segment. So John, in week one, our statistician said you were a little out of practice in terms of hitting the mark. We give you 55 seconds and you were either over the 55 or under on some of those questions. I still dispute. (laughs) Roll the tape. Yeah. But I'm happy to report that last week you had a near perfect record. So how about that? Just like the Bears offense putting together two solid quarters instead of one, you uh, did just the same, except for you, you know, you finished the game unlike them. So let's Do make it perfect. Do not compare me week. to the Bears offense. Do not compare <laughs> me to the Bears offense. I'm a well-oiled machine. Much better. You, you play a complete game unlike them, so I'm yes, going to give you that. That's right. <laughs> so let's get right to it. So... Speaking of, after a strong first half, the Bears nearly choked the game away again to the lowly Giants. But despite what we saw on the field Sunday, the Bears are 2-0 and heading into week three. John, how are you evaluating this undefeated Bear squad right now? 55 seconds? Good luck. Look, I, I said this last week, and I will say it again this week. I'd much rather talk about the issues that need addressed coming off a win rather than a loss. Yeah, there is a very fine line between 2-0 and and 0-2 and with this team. They are a DeAndre Swift drop and an end zone pass away from being winless. But the fact of the matter is, they won. They are tied atop the division, and I think trying to resolve things while winning feels a heck of a lot better than trying to hastily fix things after a loss. Would you rather be Detroit right now? How about Minnesota? Hell, would you rather be Philadelphia? Some of these fan bases are already looking up 2021 mock drafts in week three. So regardless of how they got there, the Bears are relevant right now. They got 14 games left. They could probably go eight and six in those games and still secure a playoff spot. This year, they might be able to go seven and seven in those games and still get into the playoffs. So this is a year that we might see teams, they might not get hot until weeks five or six. And I'd much rather have some wins under my belt heading into those weeks rather than relying on winning eight straight games down the stretch. Don't mind me, John. I'm just savoring the fact that, you know, you're mentioning the Bears and playoffs in the same sentence and we're in week, you know, heading into week three. Not so I'm early. just, you know, savoring this, early. this optimism. <laughs> yeah, yeah, savor this because it could go downhill real fast. But like you said, I mean, like, I would give this team an incomplete grade. And I think Matt Nagy said it best in terms of we're just okay They're right okay. now, which is true. Yeah. We're just okay, okay, which hey, I mean he I mean he's telling the truth. And I think a lot of people would say I mean it was a different adjective to describe it, but you know, obviously the defense they're allowing the third fewest points in the league, um, at eighteen a game. The offense obviously needs to prove that they're going to be consistent, but they're getting better quarter by quarter, game by game. Uh, but like you said, it's better to be two and oh. I mean, it's an ugly two and oh, and they might be the worst two and oh team. Sorry, they are the worst two and oh team right now, but they're undefeated and there are a handful Doesn't of teams matter. that are winless. They're 2-0. and That's all that matters. So, John, even though the Bears struggled mightily in the second half against the Giants, most analysts are not pointing blame at quarterback Mitchell Trubisky. Shocker, I know. Uh, Mitch threw two contested interceptions in the second half after looking very solid in the first half. Are you seeing progression in Mitch's game, or is there still cause for pause? Your 55 seconds start now. Look, I I know I can be hard on Mitch, but I thought he played pretty well. The first half was amazing, and overall, uh, he should have had another touchdown pass. That one to Anthony Miller, uh, he just flat out dropped it. That was a beautiful pass. Uh, And he had another one dropped by Miller on the sideline that should have been caught. So the two interceptions were kind of weird, and one, you could even put some blame on Allen Robinson uh, for that one along the sidelines. But I I don't really want to play coulda, shoulda, woulda, but humor me, I am for a second. If those things go the other way, we're talking about another three touchdown performance from Mitchell Trubisky and possibly he goes 20 of 28 not too shabby so I did see a guy willing to run more I saw a quarterback keeping his eyes down the field and returning to the pocket to deliver a great 50-50 ball to Darnell Mooney in the end zone so I don't believe the stalling against the Giants was on Mitch the footwork is still a little skittish and he did miss some throws but like we always say on the show if you aren't getting better you're getting worse and I saw a noticeable step forward from Mitch in week two and the fact that Trubisky was pro football Focus's highest graded Bears offensive player and that there is an article written about how his improvement can make this team a playoff team. I was literally stunned. But like you said, I mean, <laughs> he played much better in the second week, despite what the box score would indicate, especially from the second half. You know, obviously, Trubisky, he's far from where he needs to be, but you can't say he hasn't improved. I know there will be some Nick Foles stands that will try to, but Trubisky has improved from last year. I mean, you can see it as he's going through his progressions. The decision making is better. Him improvising 
capitalizing on those broken plays with his legs and creating touchdowns out of it. So we want to see more of that, Mitch. Yeah, and, and I mean, this is the first time in a long time that after a game like this, we don't automatically say, well, Mitch looked bad. And if they would have had a competent quarterback in there, they would have done a lot better. That wasn't that wasn't really the case. There were some other people letting the team down, but I, I don't think it was uh, Mitch Trubisky's fault. So I, I guess <laughs> in a weird, bizarre way, the fact that you can't blame Mitch for the Bears underperforming, even though it was a win, uh, is, is a step forward that you can't be like, oh, it's the quarterback's fault. You actually had to blame somebody else. Which that is progress, so we'll take it. Let's you know. In a obviously, weird, let's weird, put a whole game together. <laughs> in the Bizarro Bears way, yes, that's improvement. So, if someone looks at the box score of Sunday's game, it would look like another sound performance from the defense. However, there were some serious gaffes on that side of the ball down the stretch. So, what concerns you with the defense moving forward? The clock starts now. Uh, as usual, the Bears' defense showed flashes. Robert Quinn with the strip sack right off the bat was awesome. Kyle Fuller looks fantastic in coverage, and Jalen Johnson continues to progress nicely. But there were some lulls. A 95-yard drive by the Giants without Saquon Barkley, and the way they just chipped their way down the field at the end of the game, it looked pretty easy at times. And look, Danny Trevathan appeared pretty slow again this week. And if you watch that touchdown run by Deion Lewis on the goal line, the Bears either got blown up at the line or got caught standing straight up. So this team clearly misses Eddie Goldman. But that being said, uh, if there's no pass interference call on Eddie Jackson and he gets that pick six, we're not talking about what happens at the end of the game. But uh, this week's going to be very telling. Week one against the Lions, they didn't have Kenny Galladay, their best receiver. Week two against the Giants, no Saquon Barkley or Sterling Shepard for a big part of the game. This week, they're not trying to handle a crippled offense. they got to contain, potentially, Julio Jones, Calvin Ridley, Matt Ryan, and Todd Gurley. So this will be their biggest test of the year so far. Yeah, going back to what you said about Danny Trevathan, obviously he's he's looking his age, and you know it's hard not to wonder did the Bears sign the right linebacker to the extension? You know he yeah. looked slow, his playing time even dipped. I think he played like ninety percent of defensive snaps in Week One. That dropped to forty eight percent last week uh, against the Giants, and he's never played less than eighty two percent of his snaps with the Bears. So you know that's obviously going to be something to look uh, look at heading into this game right here. But like you said, the secondary, you know, feeling really good about that. That's actually, I think you could argue, the strength of this team right now, with especially with Kyle Fuller and Jalen Johnson. They're just absolutely lighting it up. Uh, but they're going to have a real test against uh, Calvin Ridley and potentially Julio Jones this Sunday. Right. And uh, you made a good point about Trevathan. Uh, I'm holding out hope that he just needs to keep knocking the rust off a little bit. And I know that's not usually the case for people that are, uh, you know, on the other side of 30 or around that age. And he, j I, I love Danny Trevathan. And I've loved what he has done as a Chicago Bear. So I'm holding out hope. And like I've said before, I am unfairly forgiving to defensive players as opposed to some of the offensive players. I get that I put a much, a much longer leash on some of these defensive of players like oh they're gonna come around they'll be fine he's good don't worry about it so uh, i'm admitting uh that but uh i really want to see danny trebathan uh step up a little bit but it, it, he's looked slow he's looked very slow so I, I hope that turns around a little bit okay john so we're gonna get away from the cynical talk here for a moment right. and we're gonna talk about some of the brighter spots that we've seen here in the first two games after all the bears are 2-0 and and they're tied atop the nfc north so what has impressed you most about this team so far your 55 seconds begin when you do. Well, for me, this one's pretty easy. It has to be the offensive line in the running game, which in turn reflects well on the play calling of N Matt Nagy as well. I like that Nagy has grounded himself a bit, all puns intended, and uh, that he's kind of willing to run the ball on second and long or even first and long after a penalty. Remember, after that chop block penalty on Jermaine Fetty in the fourth quarter, Nagy went back to Montgomery and he ripped off 23 yards. Look, this offensive line is about the same as it was last year, and uh, we talked about this directly after the game. What's the X factor? My mind leads me to Juan Castillo. If you're making a cake and it tastes like hot garbage, then you realize you were using vinegar when you should have been using buttermilk. The next cake tastes a lot better. So uh, now I'm kind of hungry for cake, but I'm getting sidetracked. It's the it's the offensive line. Uh, it's, uh, it's not just that they're opening holes, but they're getting to the next level and really getting the running back some running lanes. And that I, I want to say that's probably what has impressed me the most about this. And I think that's going to be vital this week. Yeah, I would say, I mean, it's hard not to be impressed with the offensive line. That's 
obviously the biggest improvement I think we've seen so far. But obviously, I, I'm really impressed by two of the rookies, obviously, uh, Jalen Johnson and Darnell Mooney. I mean, Johnson is outperforming the uh, the six cornerbacks mm-hmm. taken ahead of him in the draft, which he was clear, like, right after he was drafted, knowing that there were six other corners taken ahead of him, he was pissed about that. And he's sure. outperforming them. Uh, and then Mooney is showing that he belongs. He could even be challenging for that number two spot if Anthony Miller doesn't get his act together. So, I mean, I'm re- I've also been really impressed by what the rookies are showing. Yeah, I, I think that this is going to go without a first round pick. This uh, 2020 draft class could go down as a very and I, I know I know we rip Ryan Pace a lot, and I've done it myself. I think hell, I did it last week quite a bit. But this this draft class could turn out to be a very good job by the front office of evaluating talent in a year where you know we are dealing with a pandemic as well. So uh, we'll see how this all plays out. But this is looking like a pretty good draft class so far. And let's hope that uh, that draft class can, you know, continue the hot start here into this game against the Falcons. So we're going to finish on that matchup. So even though the Falcons are 0-2, they are averaging 32 points per game so far this year. Uh, if the Bears are going to progress to 3-0 and this week, what do they have to do? Take your time on this one. The clock is off. Uh, well, I will say 17 points probably isn't going to do it this week. But uh, even though the Falcons are scoring 32 points per game, they're giving up an average of 39 points per game, and that's probably why they're 0-2. That, that, actually, that is why they're 0-2. So the offense can't afford to take a quarter or two off this week. And, and when Atlanta gives you an opportunity to score a touchdown, you need to score a touchdown. No bad drops are getting stood up on third and short. This can't be a Cairo Santos game. This needs to be a Mitch Trubisky game. This needs to be an Allen Robinson, Anthony Miller, Jimmy Graham, David Montgomery game. And there's going to be very little little room for turnovers in this game. Uh, the Falcons are going to try to score and score often, so the Bears are going to need every possession, possession and can't give Atlanta short fields. So long, su- long sustaining drives on offense are going to be key in this one. Uh, but, you know, with that being said, though, this has to be the week the Bears get some consistent pressure on the quarterback. A track meet does not favor the Bears. Atlanta has lost high-scoring games to Seattle and Dallas, and I think it's safe to say that the Bears don't have the firepower of either of those offenses. So this is the kind of game where an Eddie Jackson pick six or a Robert Quinn strip sack will be of the utmost important. I think that can happen. I think it will happen, and that's why I'm going to give you my prediction right now. I think the Bears win this game 27 to 26 in another game that's going to test the strength of my heart and my cardiovascular strength. So that's that's where my prediction lies. But it's time to roll into our final segment of Buffone 55. We call it Buffone's Basement. That's where Alyssa and I walk down the stairs. We kick Aldo <laughs> Gandia off the recliner. He wakes up in a weird stupor. He pops a Werther's original Aldo, in his mouth up. and he starts telling stories. <laughs> oh, darn. Aldo, I spilled, you with us? I spilled my tequila all over me. <laughs> yeah. Wake up, old man. I can't do that. <laughs> I had a little I, sip of Milagro tequila, which is really, really oh. very tasty. It goes down very smooth. Uh, but uh, I have, uh, I am awake. Great interview with Aaron <laughs> Freeman. He is a really a fabulous guest, and uh, and you two guys just knocked it out of the park. I'm not really really sure we need this third segment, but let's do it anyway because it's fun. <laughs> it is. It is. And I think the very first thing we have to talk about, something that's uh, incredibly uh, important to Bears fans and football fans, is the passing of Gail Sayers. He passed away today at the age of 77. And just for some context, at 34, Gail Sayers became the youngest player ever inducted into the Hall of Fame. Uh, almost 5,000 rushing yards and 39 touchdowns. Most of those came in his first five seasons because the other two seasons were kind of hit by injury. And just for more context, there was only 14 games per season. So that's a much higher average than if there were 16 games. And uh, Aldo, I, w- I kind of want to turn it over to you because you are kind of the senior Bears fan on this show. I want to let you kind of speak on what Gail Sayers uh, meant to you, meant to the Bears, and really meant to the game. Yeah. Gail was my first hero um, in 1967 when I started to kind of figure out, wow, this game of football is pretty cool, and uh, watched it on TV. The road games were the only ones telecast, and um, and, and reading the newspaper and magazine articles about Gail Sayers, I, I, I quickly began to learn that we had a superstar uh, running back on the team, and then the following year um, was when he suffered the injury, and it was like, oh man, you know, I'm here. I am a, a, 
a, a newbie a Chicago sports fan and already <laughs> the terrible things are happening. I'm being indoctrinated in a terrible way. But none the, used to it, kid. Yeah, really. <laughs> That's exactly <laughs> what happened. But uh, what just in, in, in my recollections of him and the courage that he, uh, fate, that he had when he came back from that injury, and clearly wasn't the same player. He didn't have the athletic skills that he did, and he, but he still got a 1,000-yard se- uh, rushing season in a 14-game schedule. And, uh, and then following his, his post-career and how he was just a, a great spokesperson for people and, and for himself and, and, and then being reminded today by the comments by the Hall of Fame CEO as to what a selfless guy he was, always uh, turning the attention to his teammates and the offensive linemen. I, I'm just really, really uh, proud to have been a fan of his uh, here in my man cave studio. I've got photographs of him up around. And he's just a, a, a special, special person in, in my heart. And um, and it's sad that he passed, but at the very least, we can look back on Gale Sayers with a huge smile and say, wow, he, he, he played for our favorite team, and he was a great, great player and guy. Well, obviously, I never got to see Gale Sayers play, but my father talked about Gale Sayers so much. He, I, I, honestly, outside of, outside of my Uncle Doug and maybe – Dick Butkus, Gail Sayers was the first Chicago Bear I was made aware of. And so my my father would talk about how he was the best running back he ever saw. He just glided down the field. He could do everything. He could run. He could catch. He could return kicks. And obviously, he has over 3,000 return yards in his career and eight return touchdowns. But he just said he was the most natural athlete on the field. And so Gail Sayers was a name that was Im- just imprinted in my mind from a very young age. And when other, you know, when other kids were watching, you know, Barney or Rugrats, I was watching Brian's song. <laughs> and obviously <laughs> uh, that big made for TV movie uh, yeah. with uh, the relationship between um, Gail Sayers and Brian Piccolo. And, you know, we always watched it because a lot of the Chicago Bears were extras in that movie. And right. my uncle Doug was in it. He appeared for about three seconds in the cafeteria <laughs> whenever they were singing nice. the fight songs. Yeah. So, uh, but so it was. Was, I, I didn't get to see him play, but I've seen so much film. I've seen so many runs of his. And like George Hallis said, it's like poetry in motion. So uh, it, it's it's sad that he, he passed away. But like you said, Aldo, it's just awesome that he got to play uh, play for our favorite team. Yeah. What does our youngest member on the team here uh, <laughs> uh, think about Gail? And what, what do you know about him? What have you heard? Oh, just like John, I mean, I was introduced to Gail, you know, through my dad and, you know, he t- talked about him, obviously, Walter Payton, but also Gail Sayers and, you know, obviously didn't get to watch him play, but watching highlights, I remember the first time watching highlights of him, I was just, wow, it's, it is like poetry in motion. It, it looked like in such a violent game, he's so graceful and you can't help but just be mesmerized watching him run and, you know, how it, it's a shame how his career was cut short, you know, if doctors were you know were different back then you know he could have played you know several more seasons and who knows you know what he could have accomplished you know he's obviously one of the greatest uh running backs uh, in nfl history uh and you know like john you know watching brian's song i still remember the first time watching that bawling my eyes out as my dad's <laughs> yep. crying next to me it's you know you know he was a great football player but an even better person and i think you know that's the kind of people that you want in your organization and gail was the embodiment of that yeah i love brian piccolo and you should love Brian Piccolo too. Was a great Start quoting that speech. <laughs> that, on, on, honest to God, like, that way if, too you're, <laughs> if you're not ugly crying during that, you need really? to be checked for a pulse. Because <laughs> I, I don't, I don't care who you are. I don't care what, what if you're a sports fan or not. You watch that, and it's just you know the the waterworks start flowing, oh. and you know, and then and that's and and I think that and I think that's what made uh, Gail Sayers, you know, more. Uh, I don't want to say popular, but I guess uh, more people knew who he was who maybe they weren't uh, football fans or maybe they weren't Chicago Bears fans. But Mm -hmm. we're talking about a a movie that was made uh, back in the 70s, which was a big event on ABC. It was the made for TV movie. And, you know, that was it was it's rated one of the best made for TV movies of all time. So even if you're not a football fan, even if you're not a Bears fan, you, you probably at least heard or watched Brian's song and know the name Gale Sayers for one reason or another. John, I know Green Bay 
Bay Packers fans who tell me that Brian Song is their favorite movie. So, you know, that, <laughs> that, that shows you how much it transcends things. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Incredible. <laughs> Excellent. And uh, so obviously a uh, sad day for Bears fans, but it's also a good day to reflect on one of the best players and people uh, ever to, to put on a Bears uniform. I do want to talk to you guys a little bit about the, the current team and going into this game, trying to get to three and oh uh and, and kind of the first thing i want to ask both of you is right now and i'm not saying there's a ton to be worried about they are undefeated i'm not i'm gonna try to shed that cynic uh label i have on my head but i'm i just want to ask you guys if you had to pick something to be more worried about right now are you more worried about the offense or are you more worried about the defense and i and I, i'd like to start with Alyssa. are you is it the offense or the defense that worries you uh right now for me, it's always going to be the offense. You know, the defense, I mean, they have had a bit of a rough start here, but, you know, they have the talent. They've proven that they can perform at a high level. The offense has yet to do that. They haven't been able to perform, you know, more than two quarters, two solid quarters here. So, I mean, the offense has certainly showed signs of improvement, but, you know, you can't, you know, go, you can't go scoreless in the second half against a bad Giants defense and expect to win that way. The offense needs to contribute more. The defense, you know, they do have some issues I'm concerned about. Obviously, Danny Trevathan and the inside linebackers. But I mean, for me, I, f I feel more confident. You know, if you were to ask me, who do you want on the field, you know, on that last drive, that last play of the game, do you want the defense or do you want the offense? Now, if you can cool. guarantee me fourth quarter Mitchell Trubisky, then, you know, <laughs> then I put that out there, but you can't. <laughs> So, I mean, give me the defense. As we've seen the last two weeks, they've been out there for that final play, and they've delivered. I mean, obviously, you know, besides the swift drop, but, you know, they have delivered on that final play. Yeah, I got to tell you, that's a great question because, you know, obviously yeah. normally I would say the offense, but um, I I'm worried about the Falcons' offense. You know, Matt Ryan has played really well, and they've got uh, some matchup uh, possibilities that could work against uh the Bears, and t normally I would say, you know, playing down in Atlanta, but one of the things that Matt Nagy said at his pre press conference on Wednesday was that the uh, crowd noise situation really has worked in favor of the Chicago Bears. For instance, at the Dome at Ford Field against the Detroit Lions, he, he thought that uh, the offense was able to listen to Mitch Trubisky, Trubisky's cadence much better, and so that eliminated some of the problems that they have typically have faced in loud stadiums. So I, I, I think that I'm a little bit more worried about the defense because of Matt Ryan's performance. And, um, but, but boy, that, that, that's a close one. A great question. I, I, I I'm going to say defense, but I, I'm not really sure. <laughs> yeah. For me, it, it, it's, it's tough because you don't want to factor in the expectation standpoint of it because we didn't expect much, from the offense, just because the whole Foles Trubisky competition, what's this offense going to look like? There weren't exceptionally high standards to be met on offense, but on defense, you kind of expected this team to be really, really good on that side of the ball. So, uh, are you are you grading on an unfair scale when you say, "Oh, the defense isn't isn't performing well enough"? Well, they held they held a they they held an NFL team to 13 points, mm -hmm. and so uh, it. it they are still performing. I think obviously they're still performing better than the offense, but is there a higher bar for them to reach to say, Oh, well, if we want to win, the defense has to play a lot better than the offense. So uh, I think it's such a sliding scale that uh, I'm still going to say the offense because I think that, that I, I'm more concerned there. And I mean, Alyssa kind of posed an awesome question. Let's say, there's you know two minutes left and the ball's on the 20 yard line going you got 80 yards do you want the defense on the field to seal the deal or do you want the offense on the field to go score and win the game i mm. <laughs> i don't know yeah I, <laughs> yeah I would, would i rather say i don't would you rather be up by four with the defense on the field or would you rather be down two with the offense on the field i, I don't i Something in me wants the defense on the field. Wow, that is a great question. I, I almost think that I want, because Mitch has played so well on on fourth quarter drives and, and, and things like that, that I, I would want Mitch and the offense out there to try to win the game. And I'm a little bit worried about what how the defense bends so much during critical mm -hmm. times and sometimes break. I will say this with absolute 100% certainty, I don't want the special teams out there. 
<laughs> no, absolutely that's what, not. And, that, and that's and that's, that's kind of what that's kind of what I was saying. Like, <laughs> if, they, if let's say you're up four, so that the, so the opposing offense would have to score a touchdown, so they'd have to give up the whole eighty yards. Right. Or would you rather be down two, where Mitch just has to get in field goal range, and then we got to put it on the foot of Cairo Santos? <laughs> give me the defense. <laughs> <laughs> Give me the Give me the, I can't like I thought for a while there that, you know, maybe Matt Nagy would have a decision to make about kicker, you know, mm-hmm. if Santos continued to perform at a high level. Mm-hmm. But I mean, I think that he I mean, he he missed a 50 yarder, but I feel like he could have maybe locked up that job if he had made it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he didn't. So, I mean, I feel like we're going to be seeing Eddie Pinheiro here. But, I mean, still, I, I don't feel confident about any Chicago kicker getting up there to kick a game winning field goal. It's just. It's ingrained in me at this point after Robbie left, so you know, still gave me the defense. Although I want to, I want to hit on something that you brought up on Bear Football, our post game show here on the Barroom Network. Uh, we're talking about the play calling. For the most part, we were pretty happy with it, except late in the game, whenever they needed what one or two yards, and they decided to pass on third and fourth down. Is that something like the the just randomness or the inconsistency there where they did run the ball down the Giants' throat and then thought, well, this is working. We better switch it up before they get used to it kind of thing. Uh, is that something that still concerns you going forward that, you know, a, a third and short, fourth and short, we're still going to try to be the smartest man in the room and do something <laughs> crazy to try to, you know, we're, we're going to have to do a bank shot to Bobby Massey again, or, <laughs> or just, you're hoping that, you know, that they learn, learn the lesson after that. I think I really do believe that they are learning their lesson, but it's like, you know, the kid that learns, you know, you don't put your hand in the fire, but, uh, you know, the next day he goes ahead and puts his hand in the fire again. Uh, yeah. So there's that penchant just to, because Nagy is a quarterback, he just loves to throw the ball. Now, um, he did talk, he was asked today, uh, today being Wednesday, about the identity of the offense. And... Um, and he responded by, you know, we're learning that the run game has a huge part of it. So let me play that, and I think it might help kind of get a clearer picture of 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 what you're asking. Uh, we're we're trying to create an identity right now, and you can see that running the ball is important to us. Uh, I feel like there's been growth in that area across the board, the whole offense in, in general. Um, and so. Uh, when, what gets difficult is when the teams know that you're going to run it. So that's been the number one challenge to, to us. Then you got to be able to counter that back with some of the play actions that you see, some movements, um, you know, whether it's some screens. And then you got to also pick your shots. You got to know when to be aggressive with your shots. Uh, right now, you know, there, that's a that's a spot where we could probably improve a little bit. But you got to do it at the right time. And 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 so uh, I just I'm happy with the persistence of making sure that we stay true to that to that run game because it is very important you got to have it isn't that isn't that an interesting response you got to pick your spots but you got to know when to do it yeah because you've messed up a couple times <laughs> right yeah so i think that's like a a subtle way of saying uh we, we yeah we screwed that up. <laughs> really <laughs> we should, shouldn't have done that but uh, how, how much of that though you know the saying that the commitment to the running game and you know obviously it's going to be a big part of the offense how much of that is the new coaching staff coming in how much is that of Juan Castillo or Bill Lazor saying hey this is working don't throw the ball <laughs> how much mm-hmm. how, how, how much is, how much influence do you think those new coaches actually have I think they have a lot of influence I think um Thinking back to the offseason when Nagy was talking to reporters, he was talking about a collaborative process uh, between all of the offensive coaches uh, and how you know they were they spent the whole offseason going through all you know the film from last year and talking about what went right, but also what went wrong and how to fix that. And I think that you know because we're seeing the Bears more committed to the run, you're seeing Matt Nagy you know be open to that collaboration. You know, I still wanted to see obviously when when David Montgomery's running for ten yards, you know nine yards, and you throw it on third and one or fourth and one, like I mean, just give him the rock and let him go. But you know, I I appreciate him wanting to take those shots. Uh, but I mean, I am. I feel more encouraged than I do last year at this time, or even like later in the season, where I just thought that Matt Nagy was so stubborn that he wasn't going to listen to anybody. And now he's got those guys in place that are there to let him know, hey, this is working. Let's keep doing it. Or that's not working. We got to go back to the run game. So I feel a lot better knowing that the guys around him have a good understanding, and we've seen we're seeing that it's been working these first couple of games. Yeah, it appears to me that the self scouting that they did during the off season has paid off dividends and. 
doing an inventory of what their players' strengths are and then picking up a guy like Jermaine Ifidi, who is a road blocker. He's, he's a big, big body who can open up holes for the running game. I think that has had a huge impact. These new coaches, I think, are, 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 are providing a constant reminder. I think Juan Castillo is one tough SOB, and so he's probably mm-hmm. not at all afraid to tell Matt Nagy, you better F and run the ball here because I'm getting <laughs> tired of having my guys backpedal all game. Anyway, so I, I think, yeah, I, I'm – I'm encouraged. I really, really am encouraged. Just like you said during the show, John, about Mitchell Trubisky, I'm encouraged about Mitchell. I'm encouraged about the play calling. I'm encouraged with the offensive lines blocking. I'm encouraged about just about everything when it comes to the offense. Really, the only thing that's kind of concerning me a little bit is the defense. So it's an interesting uh, uh, dynamic that's going on with the Bears. (laughs) Really. (laughs) Yeah, and, and honestly, I think that goes back to expecting more out of the defense to begin with, yep. and then the, and then potentially the offense exceeding expectations. So it's easy mm-hmm. to say, mm-hmm. I'm worried about the defense. Well, it's because they're because you rank them an A and they're performing at a B whenever you originally ranked the offense at a D and they're playing at maybe a B minus, and you're just like, oh, well, uh, I'm concerned about the defense now. <laughs> but right. things are just kind of leveling out a little bit. And this, I think a big spark on the offense and is going to continue to be a spark on the offense is that fifth round pick in Darnell Mooney and I know I've been beating the drum for him since before he was even drafted but it looks like this guy is poised to not just you know I, th- I think he already has usurped Ted Ginn's role but uh, I but <laughs> I mean if, if if Anthony Miller doesn't keep I mean uh, and one game does not a career make but uh if, if Anthony Miller doesn't uh turn it up a notch or keep taking the steps that we expect uh are we talking about Darnell Mooney being that number two guy I would definitely say so. I mean, I've been really impressed with what he's like, how like he looks so comfortable out there. He looks like a veteran. I, I've heard guys, you know, saying that about both Jalen Johnson and Darnell Mooney. He, they look like veterans out on the field and they've played two games. But Mooney, you know, with Anthony Miller, he needs to prove that he can be consistent. It's just like with Trubisky. It's just like with the whole offense. He needs to prove he can be consistent. And meanwhile, you have Darnell Mooney, who's out here balling. Uh, as a rookie two games in but you know I just I still can't believe that <laughs> that again Ryan Pace like he knows how to draft these get these late round steals mm. why can't he do that in the first round please like, <laughs> <laughs> please <laughs> absolutely you know uh Alan Robinson was asked about Darnell movie a couple a couple he was asked about Darnell Mo- Mooney uh, a couple of times during Wednesday's press conference and one of the one of the responses was interesting. He asked, uh, he was asked, what advice have you given uh, Mooney? And this is what he said. I look at, you know, I think about when I was a rookie, you know, and, and, and just the kind of group that I came into, you know, I came into a very, very young group. You know, I believe the draft class that I came in, I think we drafted uh, six rookies on offense or seven rookies on offense, you know, so being surrounded by a lot of young guys, you know, you kind of just trying to find it on your own, you know, so as much time as I can, you know, kind of give, to some of the younger guys, you know, just for things to think about, you know, different ways to see the game, you know, how you can start taking care of your body early on and, and you know, focusing on those little things to give yourself longevity in this league. You know, again, that's 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 very important. You know, some things, you know, early in my career that I wish that I could have done differently and had the knowledge to do differently. So anything like that, you know, I tell I try to bounce ideas off of guys all the time as far as workout routines and season, you know, again, uh, a nutrition, you know, how to take care of your body, you know, body maintenance and everything, you know, because that's that's what's most important. You know, I mean, I've been able to gain a lot of knowledge in this league. And I try to spread it to some of the younger guys as much as possible. I love that response because it talks about the veteran uh, leadership, mentorship, uh, and a guy like Darnell Mooney really, really needs that kind of stuff. It, it's bolstered his confidence. He, he's clearly much more prepared to play than you've seen most rookies. And have you ever mm-hmm. seen Darnell Mooney interviewed? He he looks like Bambi. He looks like such a sweet, innocent <laughs> high school kind of kid. And so, have, like right, so having a guy like A-Rob giving you advice on everything from, you know, how do you how to behave to what to eat and uh, running pass routes and stuff has to be really huge for Darnell Mooney. I'm I'm really happy for for the rookie and uh and for A-Rob, who by the way 
way, now it appears to be a staple of these Wednesday press conferences, which I think yep. is great that the team is saying, you know, you're a team leader. So besides Mitchell and 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 Matt uh, meeting the media, we want you to meet the media every Wednesday too. I, I love that. That's a good sign, uh, just because that maybe gives the indication that you're going to be around here a lot longer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so uh, I think that that I mean that's more positive than negative, and you don't you, you trust that he's not going to say anything negative in those things. And and A Rob's a professional, so he's not going to do that. But right. uh, yeah, you, you talk about you know Mooney looking like this you know <laughs> young guy. He's like that Juju Smith Schuster effect. Whenever he came in, <laughs> yeah. you know he's he's riding his bike to practice, just like this kid going out and making plays. Uh, and I, I mean, depending on how you look at it, he was learning under Antonio Brown. Now, I will say that obviously he, you might not want to get any kind of life advice from Antonio no. Brown, uh, but he did. <laughs> but there's no denying that Antonio Brown worked very hard at his craft and worked oh, yeah. very hard to be at the top of his game. So those kind of influences, especially someone like Allen Robinson, mm-hmm. I don't know who I don't know who, uh, a better wide receiver that you would want to come into and, and learn from. Uh, he's up there maybe with the um, the, the, the whole uh, character of Larry Fitzgerald, like a guy, a guy that you just want that it's going to be a professional. You're going to learn from and you're going to be a much better player and probably professional after after uh, learning from. With you, yep. All Maybe right, the last thing. To keep oh, go ahead. Around. Oh, sorry, I was yeah, saying more reason to keep him around. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I. I... I, I beat that drum so hard, I think it broke a couple weeks ago. So I, I, there's there's not much more I can say about it. The, the last thing I want to go around the table with this is um, that you get, they got they got a chance to go three and zero this weekend, uh, and that that's uh, that's a big deal because I don't know if anyone really saw this team going three and zero outside of maybe the Chicago area, maybe outside of the you know this podcast. I, th- I thought that they had a chance to go three and zero, but mm-hmm. I wouldn't have been surprised if they weren't. So uh, going in against Atlanta. What what's your biggest fear now? I'm, I, and, and I'm and I'm going to start because my biggest fear is that we're getting to that point where you are you're almost having expectations now. <laughs> you're you're getting excited a little bit now, yeah. and the, you know the the Bears look they they pull out some gutsy wins. Those are games they would have lost last year potentially, uh, and you're seeing them you know put in an effort that can win a ball game, and you start thinking, well, three and zero. You start rolling. Some of these other teams aren't as good as we thought. You know, the Saints aren't as good as we thought. They, you know, the, the Buccaneers might not be as good as we thought. And the, the the Vikings aren't as good as we thought. And the Lions aren't as good as we thought. So, you know, they maybe they start making some noise. All of a sudden, we start peeping at games ahead. And we start looking at what the Bears could potentially do. And I, I mentioned the dreaded P word earlier when I said playoffs. And I know that it's only week three. My biggest fear is that there's going to be one of those dreaded Bears letdown games where they go in and you think, oh, this could be a big game. This could be a big step forward in the right direction. And then they lose by 17 points. <laughs> that is my <laughs> biggest fear that something just goes horribly, horribly wrong in this game. And all of a sudden next week we're talking about ah, crap. Maybe <laughs> are they are they are they more of the are they more of the O and two than the two and O? But uh, I, I, I want them in the worst way to prove me wrong because I pick them to win and I think they have they have the potential to win this game because I think Atlanta is pretty putrid defensively uh but they need to come through and I just don't want to see them fall apart against the game that they, again again against a team they can beat I just don't want to see them get embarrassed yeah I agree with you I mean I, I I've been waiting for the letdown game I thought that was coming in week one uh like when <laughs> you know they are mounting that fourth quarter comeback I was like there's no way I'm like they're pulling me in again they're gonna let me down I've done this enough I can't do it again and then they pulled it off so then like heading into the Giants game I was like a little you know when they on that final drive I'm like okay I didn't feel like it was gonna be a letdown so I'm kind of with you there uh but then also I I'm nervous about you know Atlanta's offense I mean even without Julio Jones Calvin Ridley I mean he's just he's been balling out he has he leads the league in touchdowns he I think he's had a, a two straight 100 yard games like even though like I'm more concerned about the offense overall, I'm still worried about how the defense you know will perform in this game. But uh, you know, like you, John, I'm 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 waiting for a letdown game that I feel that I'm I'm, I'm feeling that it's going to come eventually. Just hopefully not this week. Yeah, I I think we're all uh, have the same fear. Mine is is regression. I don't want any part of this team to regress. I will gladly take a 
close defeat than a being blown out or having mm-hmm. Mitchell Trubisky yeah. throw three interceptions or about Jalen Johnson, not Jennings, Jalen Johnson <laughs> uh, uh, giving up three <laughs> touchdowns. I, you know, the, it, you just want everyone to, you want at the end of the game to say, wow, we played better than we have at any point this season. And we know that we have lots of room for growth. So hopefully, Playing better leads to a victory, but if they lose a heartbreaker, I will gladly take that than a 17-point defeat. Absolutely. 100%. All right. Before we close things out, Alyssa, we debut our new show tomorrow, one that I'm super excited about. We're calling it Pass the Mic. It's a program aimed at showcasing female voices in sports media. We're going to talk about the journeys, the struggles, and, of course, we're going to talk some sports along the way. And we have an incredible first guest lined up. Alyssa, tell them who we got. So our first guest is a local Chicago favorite. She's a 12-time Emmy-winning sportscaster. She's worked as a sports talk host with 670 The Score and ESPN 1000 in Chicago and had a two-decade career with NBC5 in the Windy City. We will be talking with Peggy Kaczynski on our debut episode of Pass the Mic, and we could not be more excited. Yeah, it's going to be a great time. This is a great project. It's going to be a great show. We hope you all give the show a listen and then share it with your friends. And don't forget that after every Bears game, Aldo, Tyler Ellis, and I uh, give our immediate thoughts about the Bears' performance on the new post-game show, Bear Football. That is right after the game. We go live. There's video. There's reaction. There's press conferences. There's laughing. There's crying. There's yelling and potentially some singing. So <laughs> you, should, you guys should really uh, tune into that because it, it's a it's a great post-game show. You get raw emotion and uh, uh, obviously, when you get me, Aldo, and uh, Tyler in the same, uh, I guess not room, but in the same uh, Zoom room or the same virtual room, there's a lot of emotion. So uh, you got to check it out. It's a fun time. Well, let's hope a lot of that emotion is rejoicing uh, after yes. the Falcons game. <laughs> And and let me add that the best way to stay informed about all the great things happening here at the Barroom is to visit the newly opened website, barroomnetwork.com. Bookmark it so it's easy to find. And bookmark bearswire.com. I'm the managing editor over there, and we're going to keep you up to date on all of the latest Bears news heading into Sunday's game. Sounds good. But until that time comes for Aldo Gandia, Alyssa Barbieri, I'm John Buffone. We'll see you next week, everybody. Don't miss any of our podcasts. All you have to do is subscribe to the Bears Bar Room Radio Network at iTunes, Podbean, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. We're there for you.